the sound on this mic. If you power on your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, um, there are, there are, potentially there's some pew Bibles in front of you. If, you. if you don't have a Bible, you can also use your phone. So if you would, turn in Matthew 6 or power on your Bible to Matthew 6. We'll be reading from verses 1 and then 16 through 18 of Matthew chapter 6. And so while you're turning there, just a little bit of context. Context helps kind of paint the color of what's around being focused on. And so I think in order to understand this passage appropriately, please listen in to the context. The writer was a gentleman by the name of Matthew. He was a tax collector who Jesus radically changed. He had an encounter with Jesus, and when he encountered Jesus, his life was no longer living for himself and living for his greed, but it was then living for Jesus. And that's what happens. When we come into an encounter with Jesus, he changes our hearts, he changes our motives, he changes our priorities. We go from living for ourselves to living for him and his kingdom rule. So Matthew was a tax collector, and he's writing his account here primarily to a Jewish audience, demonstrating in his writing that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. In Matthew's account, he gives several Old Testament prophecies, which if you were Jewish, you were looking for these types of things to validate that the one he's talking about was really the Messiah. One of the things Matthew also does is he gives a genealogy, for example. These are all important things for the Jewish mind. So he's writing primarily to a Jewish audience, but he's also writing to state to anybody that would read it that Jesus was not only the Messiah, but he was the Savior of all mankind. He was the one who would save us and all men from their sins and from the wrath of God that is to come. Well, as you know, if you've read the book of Matthew, Matthew uh, chapter five through seven is a very famous discourse or very famous teaching. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And not only is it known at this, as the Sermon on the Mount, but it was probably what we have in Matthew's account was just a, sh it's a shorter summary of what Jesus actually taught. What Matthew did is he basically condensed it for us to kind of help people like me uh, to just be able to digest it. Sometimes three chapters you know, at a time is a lot more digestible than perhaps a whole day or weeks on teaching. We don't know exactly what it all entailed, but we, most commentators or scholars believe that this was a summary. And what Jesus is doing here, and this is very important, it's why I entitled this sermon Kingdom Fasting. What he's doing in these three chapters, in this discourse, is he's basically telling his disciples and followers what life in the kingdom of heaven is supposed to look like. He's telling them what life in the kingdom of heaven is really supposed to look like because what they have seen primarily up until this point was a lot of hypocrisy. Now, there are commentators, there's some uh, scholars who believe that the whole intent of Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is basically to show its readers that you cannot fulfill this in any way. I don't believe primarily that's what Jesus was getting at here. I think he actually was what we would call inaugurating the kingdom and then he was basically setting things up, showing us how to live, because one day he's going to return for his people who would live for him. Kingdom, as I define, you probably see it on your outline, is the already but not yet spiritual rule and reign of Christ. It's the already in the sense that Jesus inaugurated it. He came, he, he says actually, uh, in, in the gospel of Matthew, excuse me, Matthew, there's 54 different times where Matthew uses this language. He uses directly the word kingdom, or he uses kingdom of heaven, 
or he uses kingdom of God 54 different times, implying that, that Jesus had come and he had come to show us a new and better way. That, when I say already but not yet, it's not yet in the sense that Christ hasn't, has re, hasn't returned. He hasn't returned yet. But it will be one day. But until then, I believe Jesus is teaching his disciples and he's teaching us some very important things. And today we're going to be learning about fasting. We're going to be learning about fasting. So if you would, let's read together. We're going to read verses 1 and then verse 16 through 18. Now, is there an echo or is this just me? Does anybody hear an echo? Okay. I hear one too. Is there any way we can, they're trying to work at that? Okay. If you would, just bear with me. Let's read verse 1. It says this. Beware, this is Jesus speaking, of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Then verse 16. When you fast, do not somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Verse 17. But when you fast, put on, all, put on your head, put oil on your head, and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father, who sees what's done in secret, will reward you. Again, we're going to be learning what kingdom fasting is according to Jesus. And my intent on teaching about this is so that we can apply it as a family. And I'll get to that towards the end. But in the meantime, pray with me briefly. Lord, we ask that the word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, which is living and active. I pray now that your word, that you would help me to teach and preach it, that you would help us to listen and to hear it and to understand it. And I pray that ultimately, Father, that the word of God would lead us to you, the God of the word, that nothing would distract us now from this instruction from you. Father, your word is, is authoritative in our life. And so we pray that you would teach us now. And it's in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Well, what does kingdom fasting look like according to Jesus? What does it look like? What does it look like? Well, the first thing that I think we see that kingdom fasting it looks like is that it's part of the normal Christian life. It's part of the normal Christian life. You see this when Jesus says in verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that uh, they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. Jesus begins here in verse 16 and he also begins the same way just a few verses earlier in verse 2 and in verse 5. And now here in verse 16, starting off basically the same way. When you or and when you. In verse 2, he was saying, and when you give, he was teaching them about a kingdom way of giving. In verse 5, he says, and when you pray. And then he goes through about 10 or 12 verses talking about prayer. And then we hit fasting here. He says, and when you fast, when you fast, as many of you know, Jesus fasted. Jesus in the desert, the spirit, after he had been baptized by John, was led by the spirit where he had fasted for 40 days. Jesus fasted, as you guys know. Jesus also, he teaches a few chapters later in chapter 9 of Matthew. He says this. He gets into a little spout with some of the Pharisees. And he says to them after they have asked him, hey, John's disciples fast. 
Um, the, the people fast, but your disciples do not fast. Jesus responds this way. He says, the day is coming when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they would fast, meaning then the disciples would fast. Here, Jesus re- reveals that one day his disciples will fast when he leaves them. But now's not the time for them to fast. Why would they fast when what, when what and who they were fasting to and for were there, was there? You see, they didn't need to fast. But in those days, the Pharisees, they totally missed it. Now, many or perhaps most Christian scholars would say, and I want you to track with me, that fasting is not commanded in the New Testament. I would agree with them. I would say that, yes, it is not commanded per se. But I do believe that fasting, although it may not be commanded like giving, when Jesus says, give and it shall be given to you, or praying, pray, ask, seek, knock. These are all imperatives in the original Fasting is not commanded, but I believe it's implied, as we see here, as part of the ordinary Christian life, which, when done with a right heart and right motive, I believe brings about spiritual benefit. So, with that said, let's look at what fasting is. Fasting, I would define this way, and I really got this from another gentleman. I played around with the words a little bit because I felt like his was or a little too technical, but if you'd bear with me. Fasting is a Christian's voluntary abstinence from something. Historically, in the scriptures, it was from food. But it's a voluntary abstinence from something for a spiritual purpose. So fasting is a Christian's voluntary abstinence from something for a spiritual purpose. Now, when I say Christian... I believe Jesus right here clearly implies that Christians, those who are going to follow him, should fast. It should be part of their normal rhythm of life. Just like giving should be, just like praying should be, fasting should be. Now, when you hear that, maybe some of us go, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Don't get me wrong. Fasting is a discipline. It's a spiritual discipline, but it's here. It's It's Jesus assumed, implies that his disciples were going to do it. So it's Christian, and it's voluntary. It's voluntary in the sense that we don't see a direct command, an imperative that says you should fast or fast. But it's the abstinence of something. In Old Testament and in New Testament, they they fasted, they, they abstained from food for whatever for whatever they were doing, or usually for the purpose of praying, but they would abstain from something. And in the New Testament and the Old Testament, they abstained from food, but they fasted for a spiritual purpose, and I'm going to come to that in a moment about some of these spiritual purposes or how or why we would fast. Now, overall, the New Testament speaks some about fasting, but not a whole lot. There are roughly about, I would say, 16 references to fasting in the New Testament. And half of them, and this is what I really want us to get. It's why I'm teaching on fasting. Half of these references in the New Testament were, were taught or were, were spoken about corporately. They were corporate fast that the body of believers did so that they might either draw near to God or ask for God to intervene on their behalf. It was corporate. Now, when I often hear about fasting, I often hear it as something that an individual does, which is true also. Individuals fast. Jesus, who was God, very God, human, fully human, but yet fully God, he individually fast when he went into the desert for 40 days. But corporately, the church should also fast. The irony, if you guys have been reading along with us in the CBR journal this past week, 
Did you notice in chapter 13 and in chapter 14 that two different times the congregation or the believers fasted? In chapter 13, the the teachers and the prophets and the leaders, they were gathered together worshiping the Lord and fasting. And then it says that the Holy Spirit spoke and said, set apart Barnabas and Paul for a work that I have for them. And then you move on to chapter 14. The congregation, they were, they were fasting. And why were they fasting? They were fasting because they were appointing elders for a local congregation. So this is an example of how the New Testament believers in our CBR reading just this week alone, how they fasted. And so it's important that New Testament churches such as ours that we fast together. There are times and seasons for us as a family to fast together. Now, in the Old Testament, real quick, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament Jews were only required to fast on the Day of Atonement. This was once a year. You can find this in in actually Leviticus 16. Early on, they were only really required once a year to pray and fast. And it was a day... Um, actually, when you read some of that um, in, in, Le- in Leviticus 16, the, the language that's used there is they denied themselves. But it, it, what it was getting at is they would, they would not eat in order to seek the Lord or in order to remember that day when, as you guys know about the Day of Atonement, it's, it's when the, the, the angel of the Lord was, was coming and he was coming, and he killed the firstborn of Egypt, but they were passed over. So it was a day where their sin was atoned for because they put blood at the, at the top of the doorpost. It was a day that they remembered, and so part of their tradition, they, they fasted once a year. But then when they went into exile, they fasted a couple more times. There was a couple more times throughout the year that there were added fast because of what was going on. They were exiled and they were suffering. Well, let me move now to some reasons, some common reasons in Scripture why we should fast or common, common reasons in the Scripture of why others have fasted. One is fasting was appropriate or seen in times of mourning, when there was great pain or great loss. Jesus, even I I mentioned this in, in, in chapter nine, verse 15, when he replied, the wedding guests cannot mourn while the bridegroom was with them. Why, why wouldn't they fast at that point? Because Jesus was there. But we do know in history, and it's recorded for us, that when they, when he did leave after he was crucified, And after he was resurrected, and after they waited on him, they did fast. See, it's we we fast when we mourn. There are times where we where we fast when we when we mourn. Another time to fast is when we're mourning over our sin. I think of Ezra ten, when the Israelites in Ezra ten they were intermarrying with unbelieving Gentiles. And Ezra, he, what he did is he confessed the people's sins, and he mourned with fasting. In verse, 16, in verse 6 of Ezra 10, listen to what it says. It says, he did not eat food or drink water, for he was in mourning over the infidelity of the exiles. He was hurting over their sins and desiring for them to repent. And so he fasted and begged the Lord. Father, forgive us. Forgive our people. And at times, there's also fasting with national repentance. I think of when Jonah was called to Nineveh to repent. The Ninevites, guess how they responded? They responded after they heard the word from Jonah with mourning and with fasting. Also, when Ezra and Nehemiah, when they led Israel... In their day, they led Israel in repentance. And if you look at Nehemiah 9, the nation corporately fasted and they confessed confessed their sins together. I'm going to keep moving. Fasting is also appropriate 
It's an appropriate means of seeking to conquer sin and temptation. There are times when we need to fast and pray when we are sorely being drawn away to sin. Isaiah 58, 6 says this, Is not this the kind of fasting that I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Certainly we should fast as a means of conquering sin and temptation in our own lives. Christ was fasting when he conquered Satan's temptation in the wilderness. We should consider this when constantly plagued by things like lust, addictions of whatever sort, perhaps depression. Perhaps we fast as a way to confront, I think, cultural and societal evils like abortion, trafficking, government corruption, and discord in church and in our own families. God desires for fasting that loosens the chains of injustice. And I think that's kind of what Isaiah was getting at. And lastly, let me give you one more. Fasting is appropriate when seeking God's favor in a desperate situation. I think of David. You guys remember the story of David. David's first child was ill. He had committed a number of very gross sins. And remember what he did in 2 Samuel. He fasted and prayed that God would spare the infant. Seeking God's favor in a desperate situation, David sought the Lord in fasting and prayer. And then in Nehemiah, remember the story of Nehemiah? He fasted and prayed for God to forgive Israel's sins and that God would give him favor when he was going to talk to the Persian king because he desired to rebuild Jerusalem. He fasted, and then he went and spoke to the king. And if you remember, the king um, showed favor upon Nehemiah. Well, I could go on. I got four or five more, but for the sake of time, I won't. Fasting is appropriate in cert certain circumstances. And so finally, this point that I want to be clear on is fasting for the Christian and for us as a church family is, is common and it's part of the Christian life, okay? So first, fasting is common and part of the Christian life. And secondly, fasting can be done the wrong way. It can be done the wrong way. Read with me in verse 1. It says this. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. And then in verse 16 here, it says, and when you fast, do not. This is a contrast. Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. Jesus called the Pharisees, which were a group of Jewish religious leaders, he called them hypocrites. And the word hypocrites, it's, interesting, it's an interesting word, but it's used 13 different times in, in Matthew's gospel. And it originally referred to Greek actors who wore different masks to play different roles. So they would put on one mask to play a certain role, take it off, and then go put on another one to play another role? Well, Jesus was calling the religious leaders hypocrites. And that's what they were because here's how they put on their mask, if I could use that terminology. In public, they would put on their religious mask. And here in our context, what, what, what were they doing? They were just, they were, they were letting everybody know that they were fasting. They would put on their their mask in public to do, the right, to do the right thing, but they did them for the wrong reason. They were fakes. The word disfigure here in the original, it indicates kind of making one's face unrecognizable, where you kind of like alter it just enough to where it's like people can see 
that something's wrong. And that was the heart of the hypocrites, of the religious leaders. They wanted people to know that, was some, that something was wrong. Kind of like perhaps maybe you've, you've seen people or maybe we've all done it where maybe we're throwing a pity party, right? We're throwing our little pity party and we intentionally throw pity parties. Why? So people would take notice of our pity, you know, and have pity on us. Well, what was going on here? These guys were wanting to be seen for what they were doing, but their hearts were in the wrong place. And they would, they would disfigure their faces. And the way they would kind of do this is some would take some, like, ashes, and they would kind of, kind of rub, it, rub the ashes on their face. And then others would not, like, take care of themselves. So they would, they would intentionally be disheveled. And then that way, when you, when you looked at them, you would, like, know Oh, man, maybe he's fasting. But they did this intentionally. They didn't keep up with themselves so that people could see their personal piety. And so these guys were fake. These guys were doing it for attention. And it's the wrong way when it comes to us as a family and us as Christians to fast. We should not fast for people's attention because if we do, guess what? That will be our reward. And isn't that sad? You know, Jesus said, do you know what their reward was? It was people's attention. That's a sad reward, but it was the reward of the Pharisees. Let me finish this point out this way. I think what Jesus is ultimately getting at here is he's getting at the heart. Why are you doing this? And I feel like we, we go back to this and go back to this and go back to this. What we do should be driven by who we are. Our motives for doing things should be placed before the Lord. Why do Christians fast? We fast not so that people can see us. No, that's not why we fast. We fast because we want to know the Lord. We want to hunger for the Lord. Our Lord, who was the perfect person and who was God, very God, modeled fasting. We want to walk in the likeness of our Lord. But he was getting at the heart. The heart is so critical. And so I want to say this to us as we kind of go to close here in a moment. What's our heart going to be like in our application when we fast? Hear me. If, if our heart, if our motive is for people to know what we're doing, God will not bless that. We won't receive the award, reward of God. We will already have it. And so what's our hearts? I think it will be wise for us as we move forward in when, we, when we talk about application to keep this on the forefront because you know how our hearts are. Our hearts are deceptive above all things. Who can know them? We might say the right things, and don't we often do this? We say the right things, but we really don't mean what we say. We don't want to be actors when it comes to fasting. And so kingdom fasting, according to Jesus, can be done the wrong way and was being done the wrong way by the religious establishment. And if we're not careful, we'll do it the wrong way. Well, lastly, kingdom fasting, according to Jesus, can be done the right way. What's the right way? Well, let's look here. Verse 16 says, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. This was a contrast. Jesus was saying, the hypocrites were doing it one way. In contrast, don't do it like they did it. Don't look gloomy. Anoint, actually, he says here. He says, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others. What's the point? The point was, hey, clean yourself up. Don't, don't try to draw attention to yourself when you're fasting. I brought some, uh, some beard oil. Many of, of you in here have nice beards. Many of you watching have really nice beards. Actually, I've had many of you say, hey, you got to work on your beard. Let me buy you some beard oil. I want you to know that I have some. Now, 
It's not that top dollar stuff. It's, it's, it's the low end. But he says here, anoint your head and wash your face. Well, what's the, what's the point of like, what's the point of like beard oil, right? I, I'm trying to just give you a practical example. I'll take a little bit. I'll take a little beer, bit of beard oil, right, and I'll put it right here. Smells good. Makes your beard feel good. It makes you look good, right, I guess, uh, when somebody tells you, hey, <laughs> you need to put some beard oil and get you a beard coin, uh, comb. Uh, I guess they're, they're implying you need to change your, your uh, hygiene habits. Well, Jesus was saying to his disciples, look, Anoint your face. Put some oil on your beard if you have a beard. Be kept. D don't look gloomy. Wash your face. Don't put ashes on your face. Wash your face. Matter of fact, if you're a teenager in here, and I know many teenagers, I've been one. When I was a teenager, I struggled with hygiene. But let me just say this, teenagers, for your parents. Teenagers, take a shower at night especially after playing all day long. Wash your face, he says to them. Anoint your head. Put oil. Groom yourself that your fasting may not be seen by others. Groom yourself so that your fasting may not be seen by others. And then what will be the benefit for all of this? What's the benefit? Well, here's the promise from the Lord. The promise is that as you do this, your father who sees in secret will reward you. The promise here is that you will be rewarded. The reminder here is that the father sees. This is repeated over and over in Matthew to emphasize the father sees the heart. The father sees the motive. The father sees when we practice spiritual disciplines for him and for the right reasons. So the reward here is the father, is the father's attention. Think about it this way. What was the reward for the Pharisees? Anybody? People's attention. What will be the reward for the Christian who fast with proper motives? The Father's attention. And we want the Father's attention. And in Jesus, we have the Father's attention. But as we walk with the Lord, we want to make sure that our motives are for the Lord and for his purposes, not for ourselves. So let me summarize this sermon in this way. If I had to summarize it and just capsulize it in one sentence, it would be this. Kingdom fasting according to Jesus, is common and rewarded. Kingdom fasting, according to Jesus, is common. It's common. It's for the Christian. It, it should be part of our corporate church family. It should be part of your family at home, and it should be part of your life. I believe, as I mentioned, that I think Jesus just intended, he assumed that his disciples would do it. It's common, and it's rewarded. Well, let's move to some application. I have some concluding thoughts and some applications that I want to give, okay? Because whenever you hear about fasting, praying, giving, you know, it's a whole lot of doing. But again, we, we do because of who we are. We're the Father's children. We walk in the ways of the Father. When God has changed our life, he did it to give us a better life. And that better life, there are spiritual disciplines that, that we get to enjoy the Lord and we get to see the Lord advance his rule and reign on earth. So a so, couple concluding thoughts. Number one, we can never fast to earn God's acceptance. Please don't do that. If you're a Christian, you already have God's acceptance and you have that acceptance in Christ. The Bible, even Ephesians, I think of Ephesians, how many different times you see that phrase, in Christ. Christians are already accepted. We do not have to pray, fast, give, 
come to church services, tell people of the good news of Jesus for acceptance. We do not have to do that. If you ever find yourself doing that, repent. Look to Jesus, because guess what? Jesus already did that for us. We already have the acceptance of the Father. Now, if you're in here and you do not know the Father, I want to offer you Jesus. Jesus came to live the life that our first parents, Adam and Eve, did not live. And he came to die a sacrificial death in our place and for our sin so that we could be forgiven. We needed to be forgiven by God the Father. You need to be forgiven by God the Father. So when I say that I offer you Jesus, I offer you him as a person and his work on your behalf so that you can be accepted by the Father. Come to Jesus today. If you don't know Jesus, if you're watching and you don't know Jesus, Jesus died for you so that you can be reconciled to his Father. So we do not fast to be accepted. Second, fasting, when we fast, can never manipulate God to do what we want him to do. Would you think about that for a moment? Fasting can never manipulate God just like praying can't, and just like giving can't. Nothing can manipulate God to do what we want him to do. God is sovereign, and he will do as he wishes. All right? When we fast and when we pray, it, there, there are things we will petition and ask the Lord for, but no, he can't be manipulated. He can't kind of be strong in arm, right? He, he's, he can't be manipulated, and that's a good thing. He knows our hearts and he knows what is best. Three, if you've not fasted very much, know that fasting, as I mentioned, is a spiritual discipline. And it's a way that we get to know and enjoy the Lord. He also uses it to show us our sin. And he uses it along with prayer to see his purposes advanced on earth. And so if you haven't fasted very much it's a discipline. It's something. It's a gift that God has given us. It's, it's a new way that God has called the Christian to live, and to live in particularly in union. And what I mean in union here, it's, it's in fellowship. It's to enjoy the Lord. It's to seek the Lord. All right? It's a spiritual discipline. And also, if you've not, very, if you've not fasted very much, I want to say as I kind of come down the home stretch, um, don't start with 40 days of fasting. <laughs> Don't start with even a week of fasting. I recommend start off maybe with maybe one meal if it's if you're fasting from food. Start there and then at the time when you would be eating instead of eating go to the Lord in prayer. Spend some time seeking the Lord. Seeking God in prayer. So when you, when you fast, start small and then kind of maybe work your way towards longer types of fast. But, but I do want you to hear me. Even longer types of fast does not mean you're more spiritual than somebody else. Right? Why? Because God looks at the heart. He looks at the motive. Please, just because we may fast for a long time, some people longer than others. Listen, that doesn't make you more spiritual than somebody else. I think we need to hear that. I got to be reminded of that and others who have practiced fasting for years. And one more thing I want to say just about these, these thoughts. Um, for some of us, it's, it's probably not medically wise for us to fast from food. You know, some of us have conditions where if we don't eat, it would be critical to our life. And so I want to encourage you, if you have a health condition, I recommend fasting from something else. It can be whatever. My first recommendation would be ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what should I fast from? Some recommendations could be I've heard people fast from, for example, electronics or from their phones or from whatever. You know, the Bible even 
It talks about other different things about parents. And, and I think of um, praying and fasting, abstaining from, from sex so that they might pray and seek the Lord. There could be different things to fast from, but if medically you're unable to fast from food, don't ask the Holy Spirit what you can fast from. So here's now the application. How are we going to apply this passage as a family? I want to reiterate that fasting found roughly 16 different times in the New Testament. Over half of those were in the context of corporate fasting. And so I genuinely believe that God is calling us as a church family to fast and pray for 22 weeks. Now, you hear that and you go, 22 weeks? Hold on a moment. Give me a second. At the beginning of the year, we kicked off the year with our vision sermon, and then around January 10th, January 13th, we started 22 days of prayer, where what we did is we just leaned into the Lord as a family, and we tweaked our rhythms a little bit, and we prayed more and more corporately. Well, this has the same flavor, where what I'd like for us to do is to fast for 22 weeks, the final day, I guess, the final, the ending point will be August 1st. And now let me tell you how maybe we should fast. The way I envision this taking place is we will plan with our missional communities, where each missional community will come together and they'll say something like this, What day of the week or what meal during a certain day of the week should we all together as a family fast from in order to seek the Lord together? Handling it at the missional community level is really, I envision us moving this way. Many missional communities already do this. This is great. I want to encourage all of our missional communities to do it. But then I also want to encourage us as individuals, maybe you're not part of a missional community, maybe you're visiting our church for the first time, I want to encourage you to, to join in with us. I can, I, I'll be here, Pastor Jade, who kind of led us in the Lord's Supper. We would love for you to be connected to a missional community. Actually, we're getting ready to start three more missional communities here in the next week or so, two weeks. But... I'd love for you to join in. If you're not part of one, join in. But then to also join in with us, not just at the missional community level, and I'm speaking to all of us, I'd love for all of us to join in during the week praying for specific items. One of the things that we'll do on Sunday night is we are going to just put out five or four or five things for us as a church family to pray and fast for. At the top of the list will be for the Lord. We want to seek the Lord. But then there will be a few other items that we as a family, right, we're a family here, that we will be praying for. So, for example, you'll see tonight one of the things that we'll pray for this week will be for our our Timothy training. Next Saturday, we've asked God to raise up men. We've started this Timothy training where A number of guys have come once a month on Saturday morning. We're working through the book of Timothy. We're also reading a book called The Emotional Healthy Leader. We're asking God to to bless this time and that God would raise up leaders for his church. We're praying and seeking the Lord and asking him to do that. So that's just one example, but you'll you'll receive different prayer requests of things you can pray for throughout the week. So it'll be handled at the missional community level. There'll be weekly prayer requests. And then on August 1st, we're going to come together and we're going to celebrate the Lord. I actually envision, I didn't see anything on our church calendar on August 1st, but I envision us having a family feast and a family celebration. All right. So that's a little bit of what it would look like. I want to close now by praying and just giving you a few moments where you're at.
to look at these questions here and with take a moment and just discuss these two questions. Actually, there might be three. There's two in the first and one in the second. I want you to look over these together and discuss these questions, and then I'll close our time. All right, so let me pray, and then we'll discuss. Lord, as we now discuss what we've heard, Holy Spirit, will you do the rest? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a moment and with somebody beside you, discuss these questions, and I'll come and close us.